Welcome to my neighbor and the dear colleague and, and Rabbi, Rabbi Lau. We live next door to each other. So. Um, and so because there's this process of inf inference and interpretation and a legal process, there are, of course, a difference of opinion. So if we'd ask now the four rabbis on the podium, before we only had three, if we'd ask the four rabbis on the podium a question, it is very possible that we'd all come up with four different answers. And maybe even between us, each one of us would come up with two possible different answers. So we'd have eight or 12 or 15, etc. answers. And that's the way the process works. It's a little confusing, but it would mean that any couple who has a specific question would have to approach a specific rabbi who will do this process of inference and interpretation and go through legal process to come up with a decision. So let's look as Rabbi Shirlo opened up with the obligation to procreate. We have a verse in the Torah from Genesis, right at the beginning of the book of Genesis, the be fruitful and multiply, and in fact appears later on as well. And there's a debate in the Talmud, in the oral law, as to what does that mean? Be fruitful and multiply. What is fruitful? How many multiplying? And we come up with a debate about how many children we should have. And it's generally accepted that we should have a boy and a girl. That makes also intuitive sense because we would want to pro procreate the species, procreate the nation. And so having males and females, at least one of each, would be an obligation. But as Rabbi Shiloh said before, obviously Jewish Jews often have very, very large families. You can see a family behind on the picture who have 10 children. Um, the question is whether men and women are obligated. Generally, the accepted opinion in the classic sources is that men are obligated, but women are not, and not a reason why. But today, almost all authorities are by extension, since men and women have to procreate together, and therefore men and women are now also obligated. What about children? Uh, are children obligated to fulfill uh, commandments? Well, children, may, children are not obligated in the commandments. When are they considered to be adults? And adults in a legal sense is, is a much later. In Jewish law, we know about bar and bat mitzvah, a boy at the age of 13, a girl at the age of 12. And we can suggest a reason why at that age is they understand something about consequence, about causality. If I do this, this will happen, which is really the essence of the commandments. What's fascinating is the obligation to marry is, is determined by the oral law as only from the age of 18 and onwards. And in fact, Maimonides goes even more further than that and says, first, a person should get a job and then he should get married, which would make also sense. Um, I, I have uh, many of us, I'm sure, have children who are in advanced age and are not yet have a job and don't even think about getting a profession. Um, and so the reason, if we can understand that the obligation to have children is different than any other obligation. The reason having, that why having children will be later is because it would seem to me that there needs to be a responsibility of raising a child, which is greater than the responsibility or the causality that I have to fulfill any other commandment. This morning I put on phylacteries. I can understand the way to do that. But raising a child requires a much deeper sense of responsibility. And that's very important when we come to speak about the next issue. Um, we know, I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with, v with IVF, with the process of in vitro fertilization. Um, but I, how does Jewish law look at IVF and procreation? Do we fulfill the obligation to have children through IVF? The, that's a debate, and we'll see in a moment why that's a debate, but the commandments are supposed to be fulfilled in a regular, usual manner. So if a person is not able to, f uh, is born without the ability to put on phylacteries, the example we said before, if I don't have any arms, I'm not obligated to go and have a prosthetic arm in order to put on phylacteries. The commandments are supposed to be kept in a normal manner. Then the question becomes, is one obligated to have IVF? Is that an obligation? Is that fulfill the commandment? And in fact, there was a debate, there's been a debate in the religious courts as to whether a man or woman can come and demand a divorce based on the fact that their spouse needs to undergo IVF and they refuse to do so. Can we force them? Can we say that is a normative obligation? And there's a difference of opinion as to whether we fulfill our obligation of procreation through fertility treatment. And there's a dynamic answer. And understand what, and explain what that means. There was a great uh, authority who died recently by the name of Rav, uh, Rabbi Eliashiv. He was, in fact, the picture. We saw a picture of him in one of the earlier slides. He was of the opinion that IVF um, isn't really something that should be done de jure, de jure, but de facto, if one does it, then 
there's a certain obligation that we have to the child. In his later life, when he, he died well over the age of 100, later in life, he was much more lenient towards the idea of IVF. And the reason is because IVF became more normative. And so when we speak about normal practice, and this is a discussion I actually personally had with Rabbi Eliashiv, that when we speak about normative practice, that changes. What was normative some time ago is now becoming unnormative, and the opposite would be the case. And many people writing on computers, writing, of course, in the time of the Talmud, was with a quill, whereas writing today comes with, a, with, a, with your thumbs on a screen. That's already it becomes the normative, and the question is how we'd look at that. And so that's a dynamic answer that's going to have some influence on what we say. So that's a little bit about what Judaism thinks about procreation and IVF. What does Judaism think about mental disability? The classic case that the Talmud suggests of mental disability is something called a shoteh. A shoteh is exempt from all the commandments like a child, and the Talmud in various places and the later authorities give a description of what is the shoteh. How do we recognize a shoteh? And the examples that they give, he goes out at line, alone at night outside the city, he sleeps in a cemetery, he rips his clothing, he loses everything he's given. Not somebody who would classically think of somebody who's incapable, but somebody, again, who doesn't have that responsibility, that causality, that understanding of, I have to be responsible to the things I have. And therefore, this shote, it's hard to define it in, in, in English today, the shote is somebody who's mentally impaired. But in fact, we have another category in the Talmud, a petty. A petty is somebody who's not incapable, but has a low cognition. So they can't comprehend, the, the Maimonides says, they can't comprehend contradictions. They can't, it's an altering state. Sometimes they're okay and sometimes they're not okay. Someone who sort of has like schizophrenia, who sometimes has a normative uh, uh, functioning and sometimes it's not. And the rabbis came with a decision that when this person, this petty, is cognizant, when he's able to understand, he's obligated in the commands, he or she. When he's oblivious, when this petty is in their out state, then they're exempt from the commandments. And so what we see is that the Talmud has different levels of competence. And there are many, many categories. You can, you can Google this, but there are many categories that the Talmud discusses. Petty, Shote, Exil, Bo, Golem, Tipesh, hard to explain them. Petty is someone who said with low cognizance. Shote is somebody who's mentally impaired. Kisil is somebody who's simple. A bull is somebody who's uneducated. A golem is not like the golem of Prague, but a golem is somebody who's just not responsive um, and maybe someone like a little bit autistic. And it depends on someone who's just simply stupid. Um, and there's lots and lots of categories. And so what we understand is that the Talmud recognize there are different levels of competence. And each of these levels will have an influence on how do we look at that person's obligation in the commandments. In our normal, um, uh, of today the discussion is, and we heard before in some of the presentations, question of rights. What is the right of the person? The Talmud and the Torah speak about obligations, not about rights. What are my obligations to myself, obligations to God, and often obligations to society? And each of these people have a different level. So one of the questions that's been discussed is what about the marriage for the Shote and the Petty? Can they get married? And we know many times, and here's a picture of a, in behind of a couple, both have Down syndrome, who are married, who got married recently. The Shote cannot get married because he has no cognition. He doesn't have any responsibility. He can't, his, not only can he not get married, but if he gets married, his marriage is invalid. Whereas the Petty, if he's on a sufficient level of cognition, can get married, and his marriage may be valid. We'd have to ascertain as to when he got married, would his responsibility, and a Jewish marriage is the responsibility of the husband to the wife in, I have to take care of her, and there's a long list of things that we have in the marriage document called the ketubah, of things that I'm obligated. If the petty understood that at the time of signing the document, that marriage is valid. If not, the marriage is invalid. And so we understand from this paradigm, which has been discussed uh, at length, is that when we come to say, is this couple capable of marrying, having children, we'd have to look at each specific case. If the person is really not on a level that they're able to function, then we would have to say that marriage is fictitious on some level. But if we can say, no, that they have a functioning, even if it's, even if it's on, a, on a decreased level of the norm, they still will be considered to be perfectly valid. What about having children? And this is really the question that, uh, winding towards the end of my presentation of what we wanted to discuss, are they able to have children? I have a, I have a young man that I'm 
um, dealing with now, who has very serious Asperger's. He's marrying a young woman who also has Asperger's. Um, he is planning on getting married. He speaks to me a lot about his fears of getting married, but he's very much planning on having children. However, the hostel in which he's now, he and she are now living, and when they get married will live together in this hostel, will not permit them to get, have children if they're in the hostel. And so the question is, can they have children? The, one of the great questions raised by the later authorities, and we'll see in a moment, was who will raise the child? What often happens in such families is that the couple themselves are incapable of raising the child, and the responsibility now falls on the, gran the, the grandparents or on society. So the question becomes is, can one keep commandments at the expense of someone else? Can I have a child that someone else will raise it, be it society or grandparents? And the, most of the authorities say that one cannot force somebody else to, I can't force someone else to keep my commandment. So if I have a commandment, I have to keep it. If I can't, if I'm not able to keep that, I can't force someone else. And that was the opinion of Rav Yaakov Ariel, the rabbi of Ramat Gan, uh, who's one of the great authorities in Israel. Uh, Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach, the late great authority, said a similar thing but with a specific, um, a specific uh, example that he gave. He said, what will be the child? If we're concerned that a child will be sick, then I can't have a sick child fall onto society. But what if the child will be healthy? And then he said, if the, parent, if the child is healthy, then the parents can sort of force others to raise a child because at the end of the day, if they on that level, they're able to have a child and they're able to raise it, then they can say, this is now becomes basically my parents' society, responsibility. Why? Because the Talmud looks at procreation as a very important commandment, maybe even a super commandment. And the case given is someone who has a slave who's half slave and half free man, and we, in fact, society forces that person to free that man in order to procreate, because procreation is so important. The question then becomes, and I'm just raising it as a question, is who is the person asking? What often happens, and I'm sure that the people on the podium will have had this case, the, the children, the impa mentally impaired couple, are not the people coming to ask. Their parents come to ask. We want our children to have, we want to have grandchildren. And so then the, the debate becomes, can they sort of, as it were, encourage their children, who may be even ob may be not obligated to have children? And, the, and Rabbi Shlomo Zaman Orbach also thought that IVF was not. If it's a regular commandment, the regular way of doing it, IVF is, is not the regular way. And therefore, that would not be the normal way that we would encourage that couple to have that child. He also was concerned that the child will be sick. A question that I want to raise, and I'm, I'll finish with this is that what if today that we have PGD and we can now ensure that the child will not have the disability. Uh, Down syndrome is, a, is, is not a good example because male Down syndrome, of course, are not fertile. But if we have other in disabilities that we can now ascertain the gene and we can find it and we can determine the children will be healthy, would that then change the, the, the paradigm? If the grandparents come and say, we're willing to raise a child, or society says, we're willing to raise a child, we're willing to pay for it, like they are in Israel, would that then change the fact that the children will be healthy and there is a society willing? And I don't really have an answer, but I think it's something to think about. Uh, if you don't recognize the people up on the, on the board, that's uh, Lu uh, Louise and uh, Patricia Brown. Louise Brown celebrated her 40th birthday on the 25th of July this year. She was the first child born of IVF. Her sister Patricia, who was not the first child born of IVF, but the first person to have a child born, born who had been, she was conceived by IVF, she was the first person to bear a child, and we've seen how far we've come in 40 years, how much IVF has become the norm, and as it becomes closer and closer to the norm, it should also be available not only to people who, what we would determine are normal or healthy, but also those maybe who are mentally impaired. Thank you very, very much.